So I'm going to talk uh, why we want to implement it. What is the cumulant expansion? The calculations needed to obtain, to then to calculate the cumulant, to use the cumulant expansion, its implementation, and what we are, will be doing afterwards. So the motivation is that the phonons affect the several electronic properties like the mobilities, the bunch structure at different temperatures, conductivities, uh, ARPES signatures. For example, in the picture in the middle, on the top, you got the ARPES picture where in blue, you got the quasi-particle peak. And then you got other signatures below, which are polarons. Polarons is, our, uh, is the dipoles in polar materials that, that um, uh, localize the electron, uh, create a potential that will uh, kind of localize the electron. And uh, for electron to get out of that is the polaron binding energy. And uh, the line next afterwards is the cumulant expansion, which is very similar to ARPES. Uh, more, more to the right, we can see the difference between the cumulant approach compared with the traditional standard Miguel, uh, Dyson Miguel approach. So you can see only one, the top part is the quasi particle peak. And then in the Miguel approach, you can only see one polaron, and the binding energy is uh, not so, is not accurate. While the cumulant creates this binding energy, and it adds more signatures to it, one more polar. In the bottom, we can also see for strontium titanate that the cumulant uh, shows uh, the polaron, which is the second signature after the big peak, uh, in the correct uh, energy. So uh, to include the electron phonon interactions, we resort to many ball perturbation theory that uses the Green's function. We have in the Hamiltonian the independent particles of the electron and phonons, and the V is the, is the interaction between electron and phonons. Uh, the retarded Green's functions can be written in this formula, where in a, in a more light salmon color uh, in the image is the electron entering, which corresponds to the creation operator. Then in the middle picture, the electron interacts with the system, which is in the form of the brackets containing the potential. And then the electron gets out of the, the formula, which is represented by an in operator. So these uh, were the electron interacts with the systems is the correlations are included the correlations and you got the usual standard dynamic Dyson equations where these correlations are included in the self energy and the green function is an uh, infinite series of these self energies and usually the self energy is approximated to the lowest perturbation order uh, including the which are the self-energy fan middle. And then you got a more nicer formula down there of the Green's function. But this got a problem in the Froelich model, which is only one electron band and one phonon. It contributes, it shows only one satellite, so one polaron. And the polaron is in the wrong, uh, has the wrong binding energy. And at higher temperature, the broadening of the quasi particle is not accurate. Another description of the Green's function is using the cumulant expansion in the right, where this correlation goes into the exponential as cumulant ex, uh, functions in C. And if you expand the exponential and you uh, expand also the Green's function in the lowest perturbation theory, you obtain the formula for the cumulant. Here in the right in the cumulant formula, you got three terms. One of them, the red one, will generate more satellites in the Froelich model. Uh, the middle one in blue, it will shift the quasi particle peak. So it will give a different eigenvalue. And 
And the last one, Raymond renormalizes the quasi-particle peak. With this green function, you can calculate the spectral function, which is what we are interested to obtain then the RPS picture. To obtain the corrected eigenvalue, there we can talk about three ways to do it. The self-consistent, where the correction to the commission eigenvalue is by adding the real part of the self-energy evaluated at new corrected uh, eigenvalue. Then you can uh, approximate the, the self-energy around the commission and energy and obtain a Z factor, which is the normalization, this is uh, the renormalization, re which is called the linear approximation. And on the math shell uh, approach is just the self energy is evaluated at Comsham energy. So we include the, in this self energy, the lowest perturbation terms, the ones that uh, affect uh, are, the highest contributors to the to the to our green function is the fan migdal, which is when an electron enters in the system, it emits a phonon with momentum q. It changes its momentum, and then it absorbs at longer time, later time, the the phonon, and it gets out of the system. In the formula, the phonon. And the ultra and the electron electron with a different momentum are uh, described by these green functions, the D for the phonon and grief and G for the electron. And the interaction in the green dots are the coupling can be represented by the coupling constant strengths of the electron phonon interaction. We can also uh, rewrite in the second line where this, uh, where the singularities in your denominator will contribute the most for your sigma. So if you go through the frequency domains, domain, so when you reach to an energy where it is equivalent to the phonon frequency and to the altered eigenvalue of the electron. And you also got the Debbie Waller, which is static, doesn't depend on the frequency where the electron enters in your system interacts with the phone, emits a phonon and observes, absorbs it instantaneously and it gets out of the system, which is mostly dependent of the occupation number of the phonons and is divided by the eigenvalues of the, the electron. So we do the, this, the schematic of what we are going to calculate. We calculate the ground state for the electrons and for the phonons. And the, what we obtain the, the necessary, the necessary parameters to include in the self-energy. And then with the self-energy, we calculate spectral function using cumulant expansion. Just to calculate the phonons, you can use a coarse K grid, but then for the soft energy, you need a fi more finer grid. For example, the, the ground state of lithium fluoride, where you got your band structure in the minimum conduction band, for example, your social, the spectral function is just a delta at the eigenvalue. And uh, so there's no uh, broadening, so the electron is not scattered. You also calculate the phonon uh, properties where the highest frequency in this case is the LO mode, which is the one responsible to create the, the polaron. And here is around 78. So we add these parameters to the self energy and we use it to calculate self energy, the APH task four. We use uh, the Steinheimer equations to avoid using too many empty bands, we can uh, use Steinheimer to use fewer bands. Uh, we use the interpolation scheme talked by uh, Olivier before to, uh, no, sorry, by Guillaume, uh, to, to increase the Q mesh. 
so we don't need to create to calculate a lot of phonons. The Z cut is to avoid singularities in the denominator. It's better to be a number below our phonon frequency that we want to, to that creates the polaron. So we can see the polaron, but not so low that gives numerical instabilities. Our frequency mesh is using these input variables where you got first one is the density of it. Frequency mesh, the maximum volume and the minimum volume of frequency mesh. So this is an example uh, where it has converged. And uh, this, the self-energy of lithium fluoride in the conduction minimum, the minimum conduction band is very similar to Froelich model where there's a peak exactly in the, at the polar on binding energy. So we pick up the self energy, we implement it here. We do this in integral to calculate the coolant. Then we calculate the green function by using to doing the exponential of the coolant. We put the Comsham uh, eigenvalue and the Debbie Waller uh, self energy. And then we Fourier transform the green function and then we can calculate the absorption spectrum. For now, I'm using the APH task nine is being uh, is now is in a phase of to do testing and creating the tutorial. And the Tolcom is to, we have an analytical approach to calculate the maximum value of the time mesh and I'll show you later what the, represents the tolerance. And so this middle term in the cumulant needs a lot of, of a high range of frequency, but we can avoid this by using the Kramer's corner relation and use the real part of the self energy evaluated and Comsham energy. So the range, the high range of frequency and therefore the number of high number of bands can see it, can be avoided. So here is the, the, the result. We can see on the top left, the cumulant expansion, which oscillates a bit in the beginning of time, and then it becomes linear. You can see the real part goes to negative, which will create a dumping into your green function and, and of your green function in, in, in time. And this slope of the cumulant is given by the imaginary parts of the self-energy evaluator Comsham energy, which can give us the formulation for the dumping and calculate at which time we can cut this calculation. So here in the bottom, we got a difference between the disamigdal approach and the cumulant expansion. The orange is the disamigdal, where you've got a big quasi parallel peak, and then a small that is the polar. The binding energy is not to, to give the correct one, which is created by the highest, the omega low. But if you use cumulant expansion, the polaron gives at the right uh, energies, and you can even see another peak. So it creates several uh, peaks. The Boltzmann uh, transportation equation in the time re relaxation time approximation uses only the imaginary, imaginary part of self energy, which is the, your inverse of the time uh, lifetime. But with cumulant expansion, you can use the Kubo Green's wood and incorporate all the absorption spectrum into the calculation of your conductivity. And you can see that is much broader the signal and the and the polaron is much closer to the to the cell, to the quasi particle, which will affect your conductivities here. Uh, calculation by Bernardi, which by Boltzmann transportation equation lowers to the cumulant cubo close to the experimental one. Uh, here in the middle, you can see that the parts 
around the quasi uh, the minimum conduction band close to the Fermi energy is the only part that will matter to our conduction. So we can use the key range as Oliver said. Uh, you can see in the right, the Y axis is milliV, so it's a very small range. And uh, so this is a work in progress after we finish the, the cumulant expansion tests. So I talk about how the cumulant expansion comp is comparable with experiment management, the necessary calculations to be able to calculate spectral function, that this cumulant expansion, what were uh, the, the input variables necessary and that uh, what was its shape or its description. And then I also talk about what we'll do afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. I think okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, there's a lot of information and uh, I have to say that uh, um, most of this is pretty new to me. I started uh, working on electron phone last year with uh, uh, with um, with the Abinit group uh, on uh, with quadruples. So, uh, um, uh, I'll, um, uh, but this looks impressive. So uh, let me uh, let me go through a couple of questions that uh, appeared right now. So there is uh, uh, Michel Cote uh, asking. Uh, why were Neri at all could do uh, cumulant? Maybe I will ask it since it's not very yeah. uh, precise. Um, I mean, Neri and all, they were able to use the cumulant and to get the, the result, but you seem to, to, be, to need to have the, the frequency dependence to, that you calculate the frequency explicitly in order to be able to do the cumulant expansion. So. What were they doing compared to you? Uh, I collaborate with uh, Neri to, 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 we talk about this and we are doing the same, uh, exactly what he did. Okay. Yes, the difference is that uh, uh, in the case of uh, Jean-Paul Neri, he did this in a separate script. Uh, ah, yes. uh, he analyzed the results electron phonon uh, self energy from Abinit and then turned it to cumulant, etc. But uh, uh, here, Joao is impl implementing it in the module uh, that was developed by uh, by uh, Matteo uh, in order to do electron phonon uh, calculations uh, with uh, this uh, EPH uh, uh, value. So EPH task equal to anything was not yet available when. Uh, we started the work with uh, Jean-Paul. Okay. Thanks. Okay, there are other questions. Uh, uh, do all valence bands contribute to the frequency dependent self-energy? Uh, is it possible to treat some valence bands in a static way? Uh, uh, yes, the, the valence bands got actually the same, exactly the same, almost very similar but you just turn around on. Uh, so uh, we're the quasi particle. Uh, actually, my question is that if, if you have a lot of valence band, then you have a very large frequency range that you need to consider. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm just saying that if, if there is a certain valence band that you can treat in a static way that are not frequency dependent, then you could reduce a lot the frequency range that you need to do the Kramer scrolling and such. Uh, probably yes, but uh, for in this case, uh, We need a lot of, if it's possible, probably, I think so. We, we, we usually use the Sternheimer method to get rid of the sum over empty states. Empty. I mean, in principle, the Sternheimer method works for the on the mass shell approximation. And uh, Joao, you, you did some tests, right? Uh, 
concerning the, the effect of the Sternheimer method on the frequency dependence of the self energy. Yes, but I have uh, very few balance bands, not uh, a huge amount. Yeah, Gabriel's comment is about the valence bands, yes. not about the conduction bands. <clears throat> so if you have a big system, can you somehow integrate up all the low lying valence bands and, and just play with the ones near the gap? Perhaps semicolor states. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example. For semicolor states. That would be interesting. So Joao did calculations with huge numbers of empty bands to make sure that all the expressions for the different self energies and so on were consistent using Sternheimer because that wasn't entirely clear. Sternheimer is implicitly adiabatic for some things and it, it looks fine as long as everything is converged. Yes. That's not an answer, but we don't have yeah. systems that have so many valence bands that they're, they're a problem. Yeah, it's just in Sternheimer, you make some static approximation for the high lying band. And I'm just saying that you could do as well a similar approximation for the low lying things and save a lot of work. But Sternheimer is not an approximation in that sense. I mean, it's uh, well, right. It's, yeah, 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 okay. So you're saying that the, it's adiabatic, it's complete in the states, but it's still adiabatic. But if you assume that semicolor states are flat, you can downsample the Q mesh. This is something that is possible. I mean, I think that the slow conversion with respect to the Q mesh is due to the, con uh, the, the, the balance states close to the Fermi level. Mm -hmm. If you have semicolor states, you, you can decrease the, the, the brilliance on sampling there. This is possible. Mm 